Yeah, so in the last class uh, we learned about uh, a phenomena called uh, mode conversion due to which uh, a part of uh, the longitudinal wave uh, can convert to shear waves or transverse waves uh, when there is a small incident angle across an interface uh, between two medium. Okay. And due to that as we saw there will be two different types of waves going into the sample and that can uh, create a confusion uh, during the test. Okay. So, it is necessary that you exclude uh, the longitudinal part and make sure that only shear waves uh, go into the sample. So, that there will be only one type of uh, wave going into the sample and coming back to the probe and there will be no confusion. Okay. And we saw that that uh, primarily depends on the incident angle which uh, must be between the first critical angle and the second critical angle. And we have defined uh, this first and second, second critical angles. So, you have to uh, select an angle between first critical and second critical angle when you do ultrasonic testing using angle probes. Okay. And then we also saw that you need to use uh, something called couplant in order to avoid or in order to exclude the air gap at the interface. So, this could be uh, an oil grease or some gel which can be easily applied uh, in the form of a thin layer. And then we also saw that uh, this couplant should have uh, you know certain uh, properties, uh, certain requirements that it must satisfy. Okay. Okay, so, a couplant is used uh, to avoid the air gap, so that there is no attenuation before the waves enter the sample. If you want to do a coupland free test, then uh, this uh, electroacoustic uh, transducer cannot be used, because in that case you have to touch it on the surface and once you you know touch it on the surface you need to ensure that at that interface there is no air gap and you have to use a couplant okay in order to do a couplant free test you need to uh, use a transducer which operates uh, differently and which uh, does not have to be in contact uh, with the sample like how the normal uh, ultrasonic transducer are. So, that kind of transducer the working principle is also different compared to normal ultrasonic uh, transducer. And these are known as uh, electromagnetic acoustic transducer, because um, as I am going to show you now this is based upon uh, electromagnetic induction. So, as you could see in this case uh, when you have a normal uh, piezoelectric uh, ultrasonic transducer you need to use this couplant uh, to avoid that air gap. And in this case you do not really have to uh, make a contact uh, between the transducer and the sample, because in this case uh, the ultrasonic uh, waves are generated through electromagnetic induction and that is why uh, this kind of uh, probes are known as electromagnetic acoustic transducer. Okay. So, let us see what is the working principle of uh, this kind of uh, transducer and how do they work and what is the difference uh, between them and the normal piezoelectric transducers. Okay. So, if you remember uh, in the previous uh, topic we had uh, discussed about uh, electromagnetic induction, where we uh, saw that if you have a conductor carrying an alternating current, it will have uh, an, an alternating magnetic field or a changing magnetic field around it. And uh, now, if you bring another conductor close to it, 
due to that changing magnetic field that the current will be induced in the second conductor. So, that is the phenomena of uh, electromagnetic induction or simply induction. Okay. So, this is what is being shown over here uh, in this uh, diagram. So, these are the conductors uh, which uh, carry an alternating uh, current and so this is the sample surface. So, when you uh, bring these uh, conductors uh, carrying the current uh, close to this sample surface and if it is a conductive, if it is an electrically conductive material then as we have seen currents will be, eddy currents will be induced uh, on the surface. Okay. Now, if you uh, bring another permanent magnet if you bring another magnetic field around this, due to that uh, magnetic field and uh, induced current, a mechanical force uh, will be generated which is known as the Lorentz force which is shown over here. Okay. So, that uh, Lorentz force is uh, given by uh, this particular equation wherein uh, F is the force. B uh, is the magnetic flux uh, which is provided by this magnet and J is the induced current density. Okay. So, due to this uh, induced current and the presence of an external magnetic field, this force will be generated. So, this is the mechanical force which will uh, generate uh, the ultrasonic vibrations. So, in this case unlike uh, the piezoelectric units, the mechanical vibrations or the ultrasonic waves are generated in the sample itself due to the interaction of the induced current and an external magnetic field, okay, uh, which is uh, very different from the piezoelectric units where you need uh, a pulse uh, generator, some electrical signal being sent to this unit and so on. So, in this case uh, the vibrations, uh, the waves are directly generated into the sample and that is why you do not uh, really need to make that uh, contact with the sample and therefore, you do not need any couplant in this case. Okay. So, in scenarios where you cannot use a couplant, for example, uh, if you have a system uh, which is operating at high temperature then the normal couplant that you use like this oil and grease, they cannot be used at high temperature. Okay. So, in those cases uh, where the couplant cannot, cannot be used and you still want to do uh, the test by ultrasonic testing, then you have to use this uh, electromagnetic acoustic transducers or, EM or EMAT which will operate uh, without uh, the need of any couplant. Okay. So, in those scenarios, uh, this EMAT uh, transducers are quite useful. Let me also tell you uh, how do you go about uh, selecting a particular uh, frequency for the test. So, it is a broad range that you have uh, starting from 20 kilohertz onwards and, and going all the way to 5 megahertz and sometime 10 megahertz also. So, from this uh, broad range of frequencies, how do you go about uh, selecting a particular frequency for the test? So, when you want to uh, select the frequency, then first you know what is the effect of the frequency. If you have low frequency, what is going to happen? and when you have high frequency what is going to happen. So, for low frequency the penetration depth is high. but uh, the resolution is low. Okay. 
resolution is nothing but uh, ability of the uh, probe uh, to detect uh, two flaws uh, which are uh, very close to each other. So, if you have uh, two defects uh, in very close proximity to each other, so then you should have uh, two different, uh, two separate uh, defect signals and they should appear as two distinct signal on the display. And that would happen only when the resolution is good. Okay. If the resolution is not good, then uh, these two uh, signals coming out from two uh, uh, defects uh, lying very close to each other may just merge into one and will come as a broad peak instead of two distinct uh, separate peaks. Okay. So, in terms of the display, if you show this uh, two uh, features of low frequency, it has high penetration that means, uh, the signal that comes out uh, will have high intensity. And we will see this kind of high intensity peaks even for the higher order back wall signals. Okay. But if you have uh, two defects uh, lying close to each other, then uh, this may not be able to resolve it. Okay. So, two defects which are very close to each other, the echo, the defect echo should come as two distinct peaks, but in this case, uh, this might appear like uh, two peaks merged into one. Okay. So, this is uh, low resolution when you have low frequency, but penetration is high. So, when uh, penetration is high, that means the attenuation uh, will also be lower and as a result, you will get high intensity peaks okay, like this, but you will compromise with the resolution. And for high frequency, this is just the opposite. So, in case of uh, high frequency, uh, the penetration is low. So, the back wall signals which are coming out, uh, they will be lower in intensity compared to uh, a low frequency wave. because in this case uh, due to lower penetration, uh, the attenuation is also high, but the resolution in this case is much, much better. So, like in the previous case, if you have the same scenario, two or three defects uh, lying very close to each other, then in this case, you will get two distinct or three distinct echoes like this corresponding to two or three different defects which lie close to each other. In the previous case, we have seen that uh, you know they are kind of getting merged into one peak, they are kind of overlapped. Okay. But in this case, uh, you do not see that overlap, you see three distinct peaks for three different uh, defects although they lie very close to each other. Okay. So, high frequency would also give you high resolution okay. and it has low penetration. right? So, that means, this also tells you that uh, when you want to do a closed surface analysis by ultrasonic testing, 
then you should go for high frequency because as I said in this case <coughs> the penetration uh, will be lower. So, your uh, waves will be very close to the surface and on the other hand uh, if you want to go much below the surface if you want to go to higher depth kind of inspection then you should uh, select a lower frequency because in that case uh, the penetration is higher. So, it, it would be able to go to the depth that you are looking for. Okay. So, that is how uh, depending on uh, you know uh, what exactly uh, you want to do and what kind of defects you are expecting. If you have uh, some idea beforehand then based upon this uh, penetration and the resolution aspects as we discussed just now you can select either a high frequency or a low frequency transducer. So, when you talk about the defect signal or the detectability of a defect, then one parameter comes into picture uh, which is known as signal to noise ratio. This is uh, written as S by n and the idea is to minimize the noise. So, that uh, the signal intensity from a defect uh, is increased and often uh, a signal to noise ratio of 3 is to 1 is needed as a minimum requirement. And this particular parameter it uh, depends on uh, several factors uh, related to probe and the material. So, let us see what are those parameters which control uh, the signal to noise ratio. So, this can be written in terms of those parameters in this way. Okay, so, these are the parameters uh, which control the signal to noise ratio or the detectability of a defect. So, let me define the parameters. This W is uh, the lateral beam width W x and W y. at the flaw depth delta t is the pulse duration This is the amplitude of uh, the signal coming out uh, from a flaw, a flaw, which is a function of uh, the central frequency f naught. So, this is flaw scattering amplitude. at center frequency 
and f o m is nothing but this is called figure of merit which defines the you know which uh, which compares a parameter with respect to another parameter and compare them okay so this f o m in this case is the figure of merit for the noise at the center frequency Okay, so these are the different parameters uh, related to the probe, and you could also see these are there are other two parameters here. So rho is the density of uh, the sample or the medium, and v is the velocity of sound wave in the material that the sample is made of. Okay. so these are the parameters which will control the uh, signal to noise ratio and then uh, based upon this you could see what are those parameters uh, which will increase the detectability of the flaw for example if you decrease the lateral beam width okay so that means if you have a focused beam then the detectability of the defects or the signal to noise ratio will be more okay similarly if you decrease delta t that means if the pulse duration is less which means if it is a uh, short length uh, or shorter pulse then again uh, the detectability would be better okay so if you have a shorter pulse the detectability is better and here you could see that it is uh, the signal to noise ratio or the detectability is directly proportional to the size of the flaw which is obvious uh, larger the flaw better would be its detectability so that also you could see uh, how it is coming up here in this equation and you could see that uh, if the density of the material is higher or the velocity of sound wave in the material is higher then the detectability goes down okay so this is how the signal to noise ratio uh, will control the detectability of a particular flaw okay and these are the parameters which control the signal to noise ratio or in other words these are the parameters which control the detectability of a particular flaw in ultrasonic testing so today we'll talk about a very important aspect of uh, ultrasonic testing which is about calibration if you remember i have uh, told this uh, before also that whenever the indications are indirect like in this case you get a defect signal you do not get to see the defect directly so that means uh, the indications uh, for the defect and flaws are indirect and whenever uh, the indications are indirect it is necessary to calibrate the instrument uh, before you can use it okay otherwise you may end up with uh, results which are erroneous so as far as uh, ultrasonic testing is concerned uh, two types of uh, calibration you have to do one is uh, for the distance and other is for the area why area because uh, the intensity of the echo uh, depends on uh, the scattering area or the area of the interface or the area of the defect uh, which is scattering it okay so 
So, therefore, the area also has to be calibrated, so that uh, you would be able to get some idea as to how big is the defect, whether it is a big defect or it is a small defect. Okay. So, in order to do that, uh, you need to uh, calibrate the instrument uh, for area also. So, let us see uh, how this uh, calibration is done. First, we will see how the distance calibration is done and then uh, we will go on and see how uh, area calibration is done in this case. So, in order to do this, uh, you need to uh, use uh, some uh, reference blocks, some standard blocks. which will provide you some kind of artificial flaws, which is already cut into them and uh, the location of those flaws in the block is known. And when you do the area calibration, the area of the flaw or the size of the flaw is also known. Okay. Okay, so, these are the different types of uh, calibration block as you could see. For example, you could use a cylinder like this and if you take a close look, let me magnify this, let me increase the size. Okay, so, I do not know whether on the screen you could see uh, around this area there is a small hole. Okay. So, this hole is at a distance from the top which is uh, 50 millimeter. Okay. So, this is at a known distance as I told. So, using this uh, you could get an echo and then see whether it is coming at that particular distance or that time corresponding to this distance okay. on the time base you can see that. And you would be able to see uh, some other holes also uh, which are made in some other distance because you need to collect the data at different distances to uh, come up with the calibration curve or to do the calibration. So, here again you could see around this area okay, uh, there is another hole. So, this hole is at 100 mm so, the first one here which you saw is at 50 mm and this hole on the same block uh, you have uh, another one at 100 mm. Similarly, in the third one also you could see there is one more hole which is at 150 mm. Okay. So, like this uh, you can make uh, this kind of artificial flaws on these reference standards or these standard blocks and since uh, the location and the depth of these defects are known, you can get an echo from each of these defects and then see on the uh, display screen whether that echo is coming at the place or at the time where it is supposed to come. Okay. So, like that uh, by collecting the data at different depths, you would be able to calibrate the instrument. Then you could have uh, this kind of uh, blocks also. For example, if you see this one over here. Okay. So, this is uh, having several uh, steps like this. So, uh, these steps have different thicknesses. So, that means uh, this kind of block can be used for uh, thickness calibration. In cases uh, where you know that uh, there is some uh, material loss or material thinning and if you want to inspect that kind of damage by using ultrasonic testing, then uh, these kind of blocks are quite useful uh, to calibrate the instrument before you do that test. Similarly, here also these blocks also have uh, different heights or different thickness. So, this also can be used uh, to calibrate the instrument for the distance because then for each of these you can collect the back wall signal itself and that can be used to uh, calibrate the instrument uh, for distance. Okay, so, uh, this is the kind of uh, blocks, uh, the calibration blocks you have. 
and uh, in the next class uh, we will see uh, how these calibration blocks are used uh, to calibrate the instrument both for distance as well as for area. So, for today this is all I will have. So, I will stop here today. I will see you next time. Thank you.